Hey everybody, this is Tom Balator, and I am here with a walkthrough for problem number one in PSET 1. This problem, along with the second and third that follow this week, are probably my favorite problems in the whole course. Because, not that they're very long or that involved, but because they really probe to see whether you understand and can apply the concepts that have been taught in week one. So, if you haven't watched the lectures and done the finger exercises for week one, pause this video, go back, do that, come back then. Okay, I'm assuming you've watched those already. Anyway, so let's take a look at problem number one and explain what I mean by those big concepts that are really important. So let's read it. Assume one is a string of lowercase characters. Write a program that counts up the number of vowels contained in the string S. Valid vowels are A, E, I, O, and U. And for example, if the string S is this, your program should print number of vowels colon space five. Now, I said on purpose here, colon space five, because the grader is very particular about how you format things. So make sure it's a capital N. It's written exactly like this. Okay, anyway, how would you do this as a human? If you see this string right here, how would you count the number of vowels in it? The way I would do it, being an English speaker, is I would start at the left, arbitrarily, work my way to the right, iterating over each character, basically, and then counting how many vowels there are. So let's think of this in terms of the words we've heard in week one. So let's loop over the string. So starting with the first one, that's an A. Okay, that's basically right here. I have a condition, right? If it's a vowel, you know, add one to my tally of vowels. It's the first letter, so I, well, that's one, right? Uh, Z, C, B, O. Okay, that's another vowel. That's two I found. There's another O there. There's an E coming up and a G, G, H, A. Okay, that's five, K, L. All right, I found five vowels in that string. So three major concepts. Looping, you've seen for loops and while loops so far. For loops are great when you know how many times you wanna do something. So something, for example, a string, you know how many characters are in it. It's pretty simple from the beginning. In the case of a while loop, those are usually best used when you don't know how many times you wanna do something. We'll see examples of those next week. But nevertheless, in this case, for loop really seems to make sense. So for each character in the string, look at the character is essentially what I did in my mind. The second thing is when I look at the character, those are conditions. The if something is true, do something. Otherwise, do something else. So in this case, when I saw the first character A, is A equal to one of the vowels, essentially? If so, then add one onto my tally on my hand right here. So the third idea is a variable, a hand with you know five different configurations that can hold values. So I changed it from you know this to one. And then when I got the second vowel, oh, okay, well increment that one. If it's a consonant, eh, I didn't do anything to it. I didn't increment the value of this variable. So there you go, looping, which helps you well, control the flow through a program, branching based on the Boolean conditions and if statements, and then variables, storing values. That's all there really is to this. So let's take a look a little bit more detail about some of those in Python Tutor. I'm gonna make a maybe a counterintuitive suggestion here, or a bold suggestion, I hope, is that some of you might be using Spider, and I know that's recommended. If it works for you, that's great. Maybe use other IDEs like VS Code or PyCharm or something. If you have experience, you probably already have a favorite, but if you are totally new to this, Python Tutor might be the best place to actually do your coding for week one. Okay, let me show you why. PythonTutor.com, just go right here. You can fire up one of these editors like this. And let me show you some things that we might want to do here. So I'm gonna create a variable here called my, uh, let's call it my string, and I will give it some values. I'll give it a value of A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, not even a word, but A, B, C, D, E. It's five different characters, there you go. Also, let me create a list. You haven't seen lists yet, but you will be seeing these a lot next week. They're very powerful um, data type in Python, but my list is, let's do this. Let's make it a list of characters. Um, so there's an A right there. I'll do the same characters that are in the string above. Let's do a C, let's do an E. There we go, oh, sorry, an E and close the list right there. And let's also do one more object here. Let's call it my number. And I can't put an A, B, C, D, and E, but I can put one, two, three, four, five, let's say, if I can type, sorry. Okay, there we go. Now, these are three different variables I've created, three different types, a string, a list, and an int in this case. Let's do some looping, okay? For each of these, I know the length. 
basically. Um, because of that, I want to use a for loop. So let's say for um, for item in my string. Let's print out what the item is. OK, let's see how this works. This is the coolest part of Python Tutor right here, visualize execution. What happens is you have this sort of live stepping through backwards and forwards through your code. So let's click next, next, next. What it's done is it's loaded these three variables into the global frame here, and then it's going to begin the for loop. OK, so for item in my string, the first item is A. Interesting. So print item prints it right out here. Cool. The next item is a B. It's going to print that out and so on. There we go. Pretty cool. Now, one thing I'd like to tell you right here is that this word item, you know, I could have called it letter. There's nothing sacred about the word item right there. Let's visualize this. I'll just go to the last same exact result. You know, in fact, I could have called this, um, you know, elephant, right? Uh, a misspelled elephant. Okay, great. Um, any word right here, even the misspelled elephant, will still work. Now, I remember when I first took this class, I thought, um, I think Professor um, Grimson was using the word char right here for character. And I thought there was something like sacred about the word char. And in some languages, chars actually are well, characters that have a specific meaning. In this case, this is just a placeholder. If you don't want to give it a name, you can actually just give it an underscore even, which means I don't even want to bother naming that. But in this case, I would say, letter is a good semantic choice because, well, we are looking for letters in the string. OK, so let's take a look at the list here. So my list, can we iterate over that too? Well, actually, yeah, you can. It's the same exact result that you get from iterating over the string. So a string and a list, tuples, tuples, whatever you want to call them, various objects exist in, exist in Python that you can iterate over. The next one, however, my number. One, two, three, four. Let's try this one here. Um, you know, I could actually change letter to number just to make it make a little bit more sense, right? It doesn't have to be changed, but nevertheless, let's see, will this work? Well, only four steps. Maybe numbers are faster. Ah, no. Okay, type error. Int object is not iterable. Well, you can't iterate over an integer. OK, that makes sense, actually. This is, you know, to us, well, we can see it's a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4. But to the computer, it's really a 12,345, not something you can iterate over. If you wanted, you could actually put this into quotes and make it a string, but no longer could you do math with it. Nevertheless, these we don't need anymore. I just wanted to show you an example of things you could iterate over. But let's go back to this for letter in my number. Aha, uh -huh. letter in my string, let's call it. Let's do something based on what we see. So let's say let's say I really like to look for Bs in words for whatever reason. So let's say um, if that letter is a B, then then let's say let's print out a message like, oh, hey, I found a B. <laughs> OK, for whatever reason, the guy really likes Bs. What's going to happen here if we visualize the execution? OK, let's close that. OK, well, the first letter was an A. That's good. And actually, let me go through that a little bit slower here. The first letter is an A. If letter A, if A equals B, then do line number five. Otherwise, just go right back up there again, get a new letter. OK, letters now B. If B equals B, it does. Do line number five. Boom. Hey, I found a B. There we go. And the next one's going to be a C. Nah, D, E. No, and we're done. OK, so you can see what's up here. You can basically use conditions to find things. Now, if you're looking for vowels in a string, maybe you don't want to look for Bs, but you want to look for As or Es or Is or Os or Us. And then you want to, of course, importantly, not print things out, but rather have a tally of things. Now, I don't want to give you too much of the code here, but let's put in some comments. You might want to create a variable, create a variable that tallies the number of vowels. So, you know, simply ints, you could say something like tally equals 
zero. And that will give you a tally that has an initial value of zero, right? You gotta do something like that. Oh, and by the way, this um, this hash mark, this pound sign, whatever you wanna call it, is a comment in Python. This line won't run. It's just me telling you, hey, probably right here, you wanna, probably wanna do that. And then right here, if, if the letter is indeed um, a vowel, and let's just ignore the B thing for right now, you probably wanna um, increment the tally by one. And you've seen, I think, how to do incrementing in the lectures. Remember we had something, let's say, let's say I've got a variable like count and I wanna add something to it. You can just see count is equal to count plus one. Or if you wanna be really slick about it, you can say count is equal to plus equals one. That's sort of shorthand for doing those sorts of things. All right, so those are some hints for how to handle basically problem number one. See you in problem number two. Thanks, bye-bye.